Good morning, Grace Street Church. And we are a church on the move. A fresh blanket of snow today. What a beautiful, beautiful, glorious day that we have today. So yes, we are a church on the move. Literally, if you go out on the roads today, you can't help but do maybe a little bit of slipping and sliding around with the ice and the snow on top of it. That's one of the reasons we're running just a hair late this morning. But uh, we, are, we are definitely glad to be here. We're glad that you're able to be here with us as well. And uh, I would like to announce that we have procured a new space at 310 3rd Street Southeast, and we will be preparing the place ready for our first services. Uh, which is not the 28th, it is the first Sunday. And uh, we would like to thank our host church here that we have, Hus Church, for their graciousness. And we pray for them as they proceed to make some hard decisions about what their future is going to look like. Tonight, we're going to be having a Zoom meeting at 7 o'clock for Orange Track Racing to plan out our 2021 season and uh, try and figure out what that's actually going to look like this year. And it uh, should be a good time. If you need an invitation or want an invitation to that meeting, please uh, get a hold of Pastor Terry or I, and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. Our next movie night is in March is going to be at our new location. So uh, we're kind of excited about that as well. We hope for a really great turnout for the movie. And uh, the movie is War Room. And no, 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 it's not about war. Uh, well, kind of, in a way. It's not a physical war, it's a spiritual war. And it's about faith and prayer and how it can really change and transform lives. And we really look forward to that. Uh, we will be starting up our Lenten season here in a few weeks. And uh, we will have a Ash Wednesday service and uh, we're planning out the rest of those things and we welcome you to be a part of that and, and give us some feedback on what you'd like to have and what you'd like to see. Our call to worship this morning comes from Proverbs 3, 27 and 28. And it says, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is within your power to help them. If you can help your neighbor now, don't say, well, come back tomorrow and then I'll help you. How many times have we all seen and heard it? Uh, you'll have it tomorrow. I'll do it right away. You can count on me. I'm praying for you. If you need anything, let me know. I'm here for you. See, these words can either be a blessing to someone, and, and really, truly, it's commitment that we're making to do something for that person or to care for another person or they can end up just being hollow platitudes if we don't actually follow through on them. If we tell someone these kind of things, we're really uh, setting them up and they're depending upon us to do what we say, to give our word, our bond. Then if we fail to do them, it shows our true nature and the basis of our character. It is not a wise thing to deceive others, and true wisdom encompasses that due discharge of our duties towards others as well as towards God, in honesty as well as devotion. And therefore, we have excellent precepts of wisdom here which relate to our neighbors. We must render to all their due in justice and in charity, in honesty, and in service. And what is really key here is not to delay in doing it. We need to step out and step up and do those things that we commit to for our neighbors. Whether they're a friend or not, whether you know them or not, they are still God's children and we need to lift them up as well. We need to be wise with our choices, wise with our words, because words mean things. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words of wisdom that you give us here this morning. And we ask a uh, very, very special blessing on Pastor Terry as he delivers the message that you have given him this morning. And we just 
Uh, pray for safety for all of those who have to venture out on the roads today. And uh, we ask that uh, your blessing be with them and with us as we hear your word and receive your word unto us and then live it out in the week ahead. Well, good morning, church. I must say, I think we're just as much out of breath from shoveling this morning as we are from running and racing to get here to get uh, services going for you this morning. We had talked about doing it from the living room, but we just thought it'd be so much nicer to be here in, in the building and, and doing it that way, even though you're all at home. But we do thank you for joining us this morning. And this does conclude our final uh, sermon in our Do You Believe series. And this morning we're going to talk about what it means to be available. Now, there's many meanings to the question, are you available? Available for what? Now, that does require some context. So if you're at a store or at a restaurant, you're asking is the server or the uh, clerk, are they available to help you with a question or, or help you with that? In, in the world, when you're talking to someone, it may mean, are you available? And meaning, are you seeing anyone? Are you with someone? Or it might mean, are you making yourself available to do something? Now, as I think about all these things, and as I was preparing, I had this lingering thought. When it comes to being available, for whatever that might be, the questions that I might have would be, am I qualified to be available? Now that's with anything anybody might ask me. Um, as pa Pastor Mark mentioned, we are getting ready to move into our own space, not just a new location, but our own space. And with that, there's a lot of planning that needs to go on. And one of those things is, is we need to have internet there. And we've got some ideas on what we're going to do. In fact, we even have the plan laid out. But as we were talking last night, I could hear Pastor Mark asking me, not necessarily in the specific words, are, am I available or are you available? But he was asking me questions about the specific uh, Wi-Fi router that we're going to be getting. And he was using terminology that I must admit I'm not qualified to know the meaning of the acronyms. Now, I'm a tech geek. I really am. But it just so happens that Pastor Mark is a bigger tech geek. And he knows more acronyms. So I, I didn't feel qualified. But here's, the, here's what should have happened. I should have said, Mark, can you tell me what that acronym means? Instead, I played like, oh, yeah, that. And I waited for the conversation to move on a little bit further to get a little more information. See, we have to, when we're being available, we also have to be vulnerable. And that's what I didn't do last night. So that leads me to the next question that I had was, am I smart enough? Do I have the gifting that is required? And then, and then the this last one isn't a question, it's a statement. It's, I know my limitations, and I know I have a tendency to smack my microphone when I do that. I know what my limitations are. But sometimes I step outside of those bounds because I want to learn. So what does it mean to be available when God calls on us to do something? So this morning, I called Mark and I said, hey, what do we want to do about church? I said, we can, you know, we can go, you know, we were talking about coming in, we were talking about doing it in front of the couch at home, and we decided we'd come in, and that meant quickly changing and running outside and shoveling the driveway and so I could get out. But as I'm shoveling the driveway, I look across the street and, and our neighbor, is, she's home alone. Her husband had to go to work this morning. So their driveway is 
filled with snow, and she's got a newborn at home with her and a three-year-old. God said, you're available. Take five, ten minutes, go get her driveway, even though it might make you a little bit later. And then Diane came down the driveway after she finished some doing some stuff on the drive, and she said, hey, I think Tara might need some help with that five-foot bunch of snow the plow just put in her drive. I finished that, and then she came back down the driveway, and she said, I think the neighbor up there, I think she needs a little bit of help. I said, what time is it? Oh, it's, it's 10 after 10. I said, I got time. I got time. I'll make it happen. I'll be available to help. And you know what? If it made us a little bit late to start this morning, I'm actually okay with that. And I know Pastor Mark's not upset, and he's okay with that. It's taking care of people around. It's being available when we're called to do so. But here's the problem. Oftentimes we'll hear people say, I'm not sure God can use me. Not just today, but at all. I don't know. You don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. God can't use me. Or how can he use me? I don't have any special skills. And then there's the, uh, mm, not today, God. I've got to go and do this or that. Or we could be like Jonah and say, mm, not today, God. I ain't doing that. I know what you're going to do. I'm out of here. And take off running the other direction. Or it's just simply... God, I'm sorry. I'm too busy. I could have said that this morning. God, I'm too busy to go get that. I don't have time to get those driveways before we have to uh, start service this morning. Mm, didn't sit right with me. It's all about those priorities. And, and I've always kind of operated on this whole if not now, when kind of attitude. It kind of goes back to uh, 20 plus years ago when I heard my boss at that time, he said, if you don't have time to do it right now, when will you? So if you're only going to do it halfway, when are you going to have time to come back and finish it up and do, get it all done right? Just do it right the first time. Take the extra few minutes, get it done. Because the fact of the matter is that there are so many moments in a day and I should have probably done the math and figured out how many minutes and seconds there are in a day. But here's the thing. Throughout each and every day, we have defining moments. Now, are those defining moments, are you taking and doing something with those? Or are you letting those pass us by or pass you by because you're too busy, you're not paying attention? What is it? Now here's the thing, and let's go back to the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, please go see it, rent it, uh, check it out. It streams online. You can pick up the DVD. I think I saw it at Walmart for all of 10 bucks. So go get it, watch it. If you need, if you want to borrow it, let us know. We'll lend it to you, we have it. But in this movie, um, Pastor Matthew uh, and his wife um, are going through a struggle. And in the midst of their struggle, he has come across this homeless young girl who is almost full-term pregnant. And right now, she's sitting out in their car, out in front of their house, and uh, they're having a conversation about it. He's feeling God's pull to bring this girl into the house. And, and give her a place to stay. And Grace is insisting that he needs to take her somewhere else. Well, he did honor his wife, and he took her to a motel, or a hotel, and he paid for the room. And he brought her some food, and he tells her to get some rest and to take care of herself. And then ne the ne very next scene is Grace arriving at the door of the hotel and apologizing to the girl for turning her away. Grace was convicted by God for turning this girl away. And she asked this girl for forgiveness. Now here's this, a little bit more backstory behind that. Grace isn't able to have kids. And it was in her own uh, insecurity that she wanted 
Pastor Matthew to take her somewhere else. Now this leads to a whole another dynamic to this story. And this movie, if you haven't seen it, it's about 12 lives intersecting in, in a major way, in a God way. And we, again, I highly advise you to, to see this movie. But this takes us to our first big scripture of the day. We're going to be in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And here is what James writes. He says, look here, you who say today or tomorrow, we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We'll do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you were boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. See, here in James is, is reprimanding the people. He, he rebukes them. He, he says, you're, you're making plans for your lives without any regard for the care and guidance that God has is going to give you. Now, you've heard Mark and I say this many times. Grace Street Church is the name of our church, but the ministry name, the ministry name that is above Grace Street Church, North Track Racing, and our movie ministry, and all that is called Prayer, Care, Share Ministries. And in that, the very first thing that we do when we're going to do something is we pray about it. We talk to God about it. We go to God and request His guidance. When it, we determined that it was time to start looking for our own space, we prayed together, we prayed separately, we prayed daily, we prayed multiple times per day. We had multiple different opportunities that got placed in front of us. In fact, we had one that had, was placed in front of us and then taken away and then put back in front of us and then taken away again. And ultimately, through prayer, God showed his care for us, and he gave us his guidance, and he led us to the space that he had for us. That's how we can make this move and know in our hearts that God is leading, and it has nothing to do with our own pretentious plans, as James calls it. Now, if we go back to the, the context of this passage, and Mark and I are always big about this, you've got to go into the context of the passage. He's actually talking to the itinerant uh, or the traveling merchants of the day. And see, those merchants would travel from place to place, and they would set up, and they would sell their wares, and then they would pack up and go, and they would make their plans to where they were going. So often, we plan to do things, but there's so many darn variables involved the reality is we can't control them. Last night, the weather hadn't really kicked in. We didn't know what was going to happen. We waited until this morning to decide what we were going to do at church. Will we have uh, people with us here today or will we just do it online? We had no idea what this morning would bring. And then when Mark picked me up, he was telling me about how the streets were pretty awful on the way over. And we had no idea what the streets were going to be like from when he picked me up until we got here to the church. Praise God, they were clean. And we got here safely. But we didn't know. We can't predict the weather. We can weather meteorologists, they try. And they do the best that they can. But there's too many variables. If the wind shifts, we could have ended up with a lot more ice and a lot less snow, or we could have ended up with a lot more snow. We could have ended up with absolutely nothing. That's happened before. We just don't know what those variables will be. So that said, it's always best to take it to God first. It's not, and I, and I, I think about a boxer, and you'll, you'll, Think, just listen to the, what I'm about to say, and, and you'll think of it yourself if you're old enough here. It's not how great I am. 
It's how great our God is. Let me repeat that. It's not how great I am. It's not how great you are. It's how great our God is. So that brings us to point number one this morning. Don't lead God out of your goals. Now, you could be at work and your boss has a meeting with you and he says, so where do you want to be in the next year, five years, ten years? Well, we can have an idea of that. We can say, well, I would like to be doing this or that. But here's the thing. When I'm asked these questions, and especially since I've been uh, where I'm at right now, when I'm asked where I'm, what I'm doing, it's like, well, here's the thing. You provided me with a wonderful opportunity to work here. Just so happens I'm pretty darn good at what I do. And in all the years that I've been doing it, we do, we do shift bids all the time, where our shifts ebb and flow and can be different right now. I'm on 10 to 7s, Monday through Friday one week, Monday through Thursday and Saturday the next. It just drives Mark nuts because he can't keep up with me. The previous shift I had was two or 3.30 to 11. We worried about that. I prayed about it. And God made it happen. He gave me Wednesday nights off, so I was off for Bible study. He gave me Saturdays off for our orange track racing and for movie ministry and any other kind of ministry that day. And because I went in at 3.30, well, that meant I went to church in the morning on Sunday. God has been in it every moment. So I don't leave God out of my goals because i tell you what, he's not telling us that we shouldn't have plans or goals. But here's the thing. Are you available if God changes your plans? We just don't want to leave him out of the planning. We want to make him the very center of those goals. Verse 12 reminds us that we cannot know what the future brings. The only certainty that we have is the word. Now, I don't know about you, I forget things all the time. In fact, I meant to bring my Bible up here with me this morning so that I could have that. It's sitting back on the table back there. I forget things. God doesn't forget. And that's why if we make him the center of it all, then everything works out for his good. Let's face it, life is short. Doesn't matter how long we live, it's too short. This afternoon, Pastor Mark and I will be uh, officiating a a memorial service, a celebration of life uh, for one of our members' fiancés. Life is too short. He's my age. I just had another friend uh, who was a little younger than me that passed away. Mark just had a friend who was his age that passed away. There's been, life is short. And we, do you want to get to the end of it and go, oh, I wish I'd have done this or I wish I'd have done that. Quite frankly, all the worldly things, I'm okay with it, whether I did them or not. But did I do what God wanted me to do? That's what I'm concerned about. And that's where my mind and my focus is. We have to live for God every moment of every day. So live for God today. And that if that James is talking about in verse 15, that should be a reminder that these events are dependent on so many variables. I already talked about how future events are conditional. My daughter Marissa and her now husband Gabe had made plans to get married on August 8th of last year. The coronavirus it in March and pretty much tossed those plans out the door. So we went to God and we asked God what he wanted. And he, well, hey, we had a Zoom wedding and then we had the, the bigger celebration and actual service in October. We let God lead. Those events were conditional. And because of that conditionality of those events, our primary concern in all our future planning needs to be taken to God. How many times do you read in the scripture that because they didn't take it to God, that God foiled their plans? It is only through his will 
that the plans will happen. So let's face it, God has authority over everything. Life, death, and everything else. So listen to what Jesus teaches us about this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. And this is what Jesus says. He says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. We are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. He knows the hairs on our head. He is in control. Verse 16, if we go back to James, tells us that boasting of our own power and our own accomplishments is evil. It's evil when we leave God out of the equation. So listen to what Paul tells, and he, he, this is out of 2 Corinthians, and between uh, chapter 11 and chapter 12, he gives us three really great nuggets of, of information here. So this is what Paul uh, is telling the Corinthians and us. He says, if I must boast, and he's talking about himself, he said, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. And then in 12.5, he says, that experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weakness. And then finally, 12.9, he says, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. You see where he's going with this? He's saying that in, in boasting of his weakness, he's showing how great God is. If we are going to boast, Let's boast about what God is doing in our lives. Leaving God out just simply means that we're saying he has no authority over us. And I'm sorry for, uh, if you think he doesn't, because he has all authority over us. And we, we just can't ignore that. And that's our next point. Don't ignore it. In verse 17, we're reminded that to know to do something and not do it is a sin. So more specifically, to ignore God's prompting is sin. When God tells you to do something and we don't do it, it's sinful. And, and in this, I think of sin, you know, we think of sin as, oh, stealing or, you know, coveting or murder, those things. Sin is also when we neglect what God is wanting to do or we omit something. So there's the sins of neglect and omission that we have to be careful of. And that's called out in the Old and the New Testament. Mark read from, uh, for our, our call to worship this morning from Proverbs 3, verses 27 28, where he said, Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. If you, can get, or if you can help your neighbor now, don't say come back tomorrow and then I'll help you. Watching people shovel this morning because they didn't have a blower and I'm sitting here with this nice blower and not doing anything about it, well, they would have tried to finish it. They could have potentially hurt themselves because it was heavy. I had to go do it. When we bought that Snowblower, first thing out of my mouth to my wife was, if we're spending this much money on a snowblower, this is a tool. This is a, uh, a tool of evangelism to the neighborhood, whether the neighbors know it or not. And that's what we use it for. Now, teach, uh, Jesus teaches this more, so going back to the New Testament, Matthew 25, 41 and 46, he says, Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you! You cursed ones into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? 
And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. And this is why the scriptures tell us that the path to hell, it's a highway to hell, but it's a, it's a very narrow path, a narrow gate to heaven. It's not about being good. It's about having faith. And we'll talk about that more here in a moment. Sin isn't just doing wrong things. It's not doing what is right in the first place. So lying is a sin. Knowing the truth and not telling it is also a sin. So when it comes to all this, and when it comes to being available, and when it comes to taking care of others, we can't take credit for it. So that's our next point. Don't take credit. And we're going to jump to Ephesians Verse, or chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 for this. And in this, Paul writes, God saved you by His grace when you believe, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. This kind of goes back to what Paul was talking about in chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Corinthians. We can't boast about anything. If we're going to boast about it, let's boast about our weakness. Let's boast about how great God is and how great God is in our weakness and what he does for us. So there it is. We became Christians because of God's undeserved grace. He put it out there. He gave us this free gift that we can't take credit for. Because there's nothing we can do to get it. He just gives it. Salvation is not a reward. It's not this trophy that you get for participating in life. And it's not something that we can boast about. And that's for that very reason that we need to accept his advanced planning. And that's our next point. Accept his advanced planning. Because if we go back to verse 10 from second, or second, Ephesians 2, God has set divine appointments for us. So every moment is a divine opportunity that we are presented. What are you going to do with it? When Pastor Matthew saw this teenage girl, pregnant teenage girl, foraging in a dumpster in an alleyway, he heard God's prompting. He saw a divine appointment, and he did something about it. And I don't believe that there's only, that there's coincidences. I think God puts things in our path to help for us to do something about it. And then we, we can choose to do something or not. Are we listening to God? But these moments are created for us by God. And because they are created for us by God, then we need to do good. And that's that's our next point. We have to do good. Those moments that God created for us are there for that very purpose. See, we are created by God. We are his masterpiece. And this can go, that we could take this a whole nother way here, especially with the fact that um, so many people feel like they're not enough. They don't look good enough. They don't like the way they look. God created you. You're his masterpiece. And I'm going to tell you this, God doesn't make junk. We are made in God's image. Therefore, we are made as his masterpiece. And then when we flip it to the New Testament, when we think about what God did for us, we are made new by Jesus. And we are to join Jesus in doing the work that he started. Jesus gave us the example that we needed of what we are to do. And it's out of gratitude for this undeserved gift that is free, that we should look for opportunities to serve and help others. That's what this ministry is trying to do. I mean, as we get moving forward, as, as we move into our new space, 
we're going to have a whole host of new opportunities to reach out to God's people. And we're looking at what are those, God? We're praying, God, what do you want us to do? Is, is it, do we need to start another Bible study? Are we going to be starting Sunday school for kids and adults? Are we going to do uh, some kind of uh, Christian uh, financial thing like uh, the Ramsey uh, Financial Peace? Or are we going to do uh, Crown Financial? Uh, what are we going to do? How can we impact the kingdom? And how can we get outside of the four walls to do that? You know, we did that in Thanksgiving when we made the meals for the rent homes here in town. So it's extremely important, and, and we want to do this as we're helping others and we're serving others. We want to do it with kindness. We want to do it with gentleness, and we want to do it in love. It shouldn't be something that we do begrudgingly. And this, these are works, right? And, and again, I, I want to emphasize it's not about doing good things. It's doing good things because of the grace that we've been giving, because of our faith. Because works will not get into heaven. In order to get into heaven, we have to start by asking God for re forgiveness of our sins. We need to repent. And then we need to develop a relationship. We need to make Jesus our Lord and Savior and have develop that relationship with God. Now, I hear all the time, oh, I'm good. I've got a relationship with God. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be part of a Bible study. I don't need to do those things. But yet Proverbs tells us that iron sharpens iron. When we come together, we are stronger. We are better together. And we can do so much more together. We've had so many conversations this past week, Mark and I have, about this, this new space. And um, I had to work yesterday, but he was able to take a couple of folks over to the new space and show it to them. And they lit up. God filled them. They, they understand the vision that we have. And Mark was saying, well, we'd like to do this and we'd like to do that. And well, one of them said, well, I can do that. And the other one said, well, I can do that. And they were excited. That's what we want. We want people who are excited by what God has for us to do. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. If you did can't call it, really call it any other. It's about what faith is. And verse 1 really nails it. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And it goes on to list a whole list of, of people from the Old Testament. And how God made promises. Abraham, I will make you the father of nations. So many so that it would be like you won't be able to count it just like you can't count the grains of sand on the shore. And he promised David that he would have someone in his lineage, someone that would come after him. And, in, and he was ultimate, God was ultimately telling him that it would be, God, uh, that it'd be Jesus. But they did what they did out of faith based on the hope that God gave them through their relationship with him. So faith requires action. Because faith is acting on what God has revealed to you and me about himself. Without action, faith is dead. But you can't have works without faith. They go hand in hand. Without Faith, works are dead. And these are the reasons why you and I exist. And that brings us to our final point here today, which is the title of our sermon this morning. Be available. As long as you and I are breathing, it's not too late. The thief on the other cross next to Jesus proved that out when he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. He repented. He, in the very short time, he ultimately created a relationship with Jesus, even after he had mocked Jesus. And he was able to go into the kingdom. But why wait until the very end? Why wait until that? We need to become available by asking for forgiveness now. Being available, 
being present and obedient is going to be the strongest way for us to show God and others our love. And by being present and obedient and available, we are going to show others the love that God has for them and the hope that we have in God. And then they're going to want some of that. Because you know, when, you see, when people see something that you have and that it makes you happy and that you delight in it, they want that. I want people to see the hope that I have. I want people to see the love that God has for me. Because I want them to know that very same thing so that they can have that same relationship. But if we go back to the beginning when I was telling you about how I felt like I wasn't capable, I wasn't smart enough, it's not about our ability. It's about our availability. God took a murderer and had him lead the Israelites out of Egypt after over 400 years of slavery. He can use anyone. That's why it's so difficult for me when, when somebody sees somebody and maybe they aren't dressed the way that they think they should or they, they, ha they have uh, jewelry that people don't agree with or, or they've got the, t the tats on their arms or in their necks or whatever. But they have turned their life to God. We can't judge that person by their exterior because that has nothing to do with it. Jesus tells us it's not about the outside. We need to be concerned about the inside because that's where all this comes from. We need to be available. Now, if you've got something to write with, if you're watching on your computer and you've got your phone available, if you've got a calendar hanging on the wall, I want you to go get it. And I want you to write it down or set an alarm or make a calendar entry on your computer, on your, uh, whether you use you know, Google Calendar or Microsoft's Calendar, whatever you use. Put daily reminders out there. And then use those daily reminders as reminders to pray that God would prepare you to act. So the best thing to do is probably set your alarm to get up in the morning earlier than what you normally would. So if you normally get up at 7 in the morning, let's start setting it for 5-10 minutes early. And then as, as you get more involved in that prayer and you, you need more time, maybe set it back to 6.30. And spend that time with God. And pray that he would open your eyes to see the needs that are around you. The things that he wants you to be available for. And then, when he shows those to you, then be available to whatever it is that God is guiding you to do. Be available. Faith requires action. It requires movement. It requires a response from us to God. Otherwise, it's just knowledge. And then ask yourself, what action do I need to take this week? Here's some of the things that I would do during this time. I'm going to ask for forgiveness for missing one of those defining moments or one of those divine appointments. And then I'm going to ask God to show me the moments in my daily routine that could be defining moments in someone else's life. How can I reach someone else? How can I make an impact on their life? And then here's the big one. Pray for the courage to meet the needs of others. Pray for the courage to even take that first step. Because when we pray and ask God to help us do things, I'm going to say that's a dangerous prayer. Because God's going to give you something. 
And he gave us something, and he's, he's given us this ministry, and he gave us, and, and we've started off small. But we are watching, and we are seeing God take what we have done with that small portion that he gave us, and now he's given us another portion. And then he's going to give us another portion. As long as we stay faithful, as long as we act, as long as we meet those defining moments as, and uh, those divine appointments, he's going to continue to give us more. Pray for the courage to continue through that. And then, whether it's with your small group or your, account, uh, your accountability partner, your trusted friend or your spouse, share the ways that you intend to become more available. Because that's going to make you accountable to doing it. See, when I tell somebody, when I'm at work and I'm telling a customer that I'm going to do something, I don't just put a, a calendar entry in my Outlook calendar. I actually put a note on their account that says, I will call such and such at this number on this day after this time of day. And then I always warn them. I said, the only reason I would not call you back after that time of that day, number one, is I always said if I was sick. After last August, now I throw in natural disasters. Because that knocked us out for 10, 12 days. But hold yourself accountable. Share with others. And then as you're doing that, Look for more opportunities. Look for those that are hurting. How can we help? What can we do? We've talked about financial peace. We've talked about um, having groups for people who have lost a spouse or uh, grief groups or so many different things. God is just filling us with all these ideas and we're trying to figure out how we can make those happen. And in doing that, we've been praying about it and we said, God, we're so small. Bring workers to the heart just as Jesus told us. We need to pray for the workers for the harvest. So that's what we're praying for. We're praying for more people to help us do these things, to reach out. Because you know what? Our new space, that's just where we gather on Sundays and Wednesdays and maybe Saturdays for Orange Track. That's not what the ministry is about. That's not what Grace Street Church is about. Grace Street Church is about getting outside of that door, walking out the door and meeting people where they're at and doing things that we can do. And we've been seeing that over and over again with the people that are part of this ministry right now. The first week, Mark handed out the little crosses from the movie. If you didn't get one, let us know. We'll get you one. Because we want you to have one. And if you... If you give that one away, or if you've given away the one that you've got because you knew, saw someone else who needed it, we've got more. Ask us for more. Because here's the thing. That cross isn't just a memento of a movie. It's not just a, a reminder of an of a, a hour and a half, two hours that we spent together watching a movie. It's a reminder of what Jesus did on the cross so that we can have the hope that we have, so that we can do the things that we talked about these last four weeks. So here's a question for you. Are you willing to carry the cross into, not the world, but your world? The one thing I've learned over all these years of ministry is I can't do it all. I need others around me to do that. The smartest thing I ever did was when we started working with parents when I was uh, a youth group uh, leader and, and then also taking some of the kids and making them into a leadership team and having them start planning and then just guiding them. Because that's what God wants to do. He wants to guide you in the planning. Are you willing to carry your cross into the world? So here's the challenge. Here's what I'm going to uh, kind of end with this week. The question is, do you believe? And like I said, it's much more than a hit movie or, or even a church campaign where you do a four-week sermon series and we invited people to a movie. It's, it's really the call of Jesus in each of our lives. And if you believe, you have to do something about it. You can't just do nothing about it, like Pastor Mark talked about here recently. 
And it's regardless of your past, regardless of your, your current faith walk, regardless of those around you. Because let's face it, we might not all have the best of friends. Are they the friends that you should have in your life? Or better yet, are you praying for each one of those people to come into a relationship with Jesus? Are you praying that the passage out of Ezekiel uh, 36 that says, I, I pray, and this prayer is a prayer that we've prayed over a lot of people recently, is a prayer that we pray that that stony heart would become a heart of flesh. Meaning, we pray that that stubbornness and that unwillingness to accept God into their lives, to have a relationship with Jesus, that that would melt away and that they would see that hope that we have and the love that we are given by our Lord and Savior. So it's regardless of anything you've been through, where you've been. Faith demands action. And action, it only can come from you. We can talk about doing things together, but that action actually comes down to you. And we're asking that, that you join your heart to God. And if it's for the first time, we want to pray with you about that. We want to celebrate with you about that. But it also means forgiving yourself or maybe even someone else for a past that has chained you. I had a, a, something that had chained me down. And it kept me bitter. My first wife and I divorced, and I was a little bitter. But God showed me my part in that. See, it's not just one person that caused it. It, 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 it was two people here. We had a daughter. Bill started racking up. I started working 80 hours a week to try and make ends meet. I wasn't available to her. And that, so I had a part in that. And so, even though I couldn't forgive her in person, I forgave her, but I also said, I hope that someday, and I prayed to God to this, I said, someday I pray that I can ask for her forgiveness. And I told my daughter that when she was a teenager. And when she got married here, Oh, wow, it's been, it's going to be 12 years at the end of this year. Wow, I'm starting to feel a little old. But when, I, when she was a teenager, I said, you know what? The first opportunity I get when I see your mom, the next time I see your mom, I'm going to ask for her forgiveness. And it was at my daughter's wedding that that opportunity presented itself, and I walked up to her mom, and I said, hey, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? And we had a, a nice talk where we each forgave each other for the part that we each had. And both of us had moved on. But we were able to forgive one another and move forward. And that those chains that were holding me down, just like the luggage that Mark talks about carrying around, those chains that were holding me down, I was set free from those and no longer bothered by it. Forgive yourself and others. And if necessary, you may need to sacrifice for someone in need. We need to develop an awareness for those defining moments, those holy moments that are in our midst, and we need to respond to those accordingly. Because it goes right back to faith without works is dead. Faith without works is just knowledge. Real faith would com compels us. It compels us to do something. It compels us to act. It doesn't, and it doesn't just compel us. It will propel you to act. And I tell you what, and I can tell you this from experience, it won't let you rest. God will not let you rest until you act, until you do something about it, until you become available. And once we do, then he's going to provide another opportunity once the current one is passed. And I love, this is the best, the, probably the best line out of this entire movie. And, it's, and you see this in the, 
the trailer for the movie, there's this gentleman who is, and this cross is huge, but he's walking around the streets and, and he's, pro, he's, he's telling people about Jesus with no fear. And he says, do you believe? And he even asked Pastor Matt this in the movie. Do you believe? And Pastor Matt's answer, you know, was like standard, well, I'm a pastor. Um, yeah, well, you can be a pastor and not believe. You can be a pastor and not be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be a pastor and not be showing that your faith isn't dead. So here's the question. The question is, do you believe? But then the next question that follows that is, what are you going to do about it? Father God, we, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your words, hear your message, Father. Father, as we think about the last four weeks and the sermons that we've heard and what you have compelled us to do through this, uh, this message, this question, do you believe? Let us show our faith by our actions, Father. Let us meet each and every one of those divine appointments that you have set for us, Father. But Father, let us start our day in prayer. Before we do anything else, let us come before you and ask for your guidance through the day, for what you would have us do through the day, so that our faith can propel us to act. And then we look forward to the next opportunity. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Uh, so I was listening to that message, and uh, when we were talking about our abilities, and and uh, it's one thing to have availabilities, one thing is to have gifts. And as we come to know God, and as we come to have that relationship, and as the Holy Spirit dwells within us, He gives us gifts. Another term for that is abilities. And so, as he gives us those gifts, we need to make ourselves available to use those gifts that we are blessed with each and every day. And so, I think that was an awesome reminder uh, in the middle of Terry's message today to, to say, don't just let these gifts sit on the shelf. We have to make ourselves available to utilize what God has blessed us with. And remember, the love that he has for us, and to share that love with others. So as we enter into this time of communion today, I want you to take that time to remember, to remember the selfless acts that Christ did by taking on our sins, becoming completely human, taking on the sins of the world, and then dying for us releasing us from those chains like Terry said he had, holding him back. Christ died to release us from the bondage of the chains of sin and death. And so as we come to this time of remembrance in here, they had the supper on the night that Jesus was betrayed. And he took bread and he broke it and he held it up and he said to the disciples, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it up. And after he had blessed it, he said, This is my blood of a new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is our release. The body and the blood of Christ, by his body being broken and his blood being shed, we are released from death and assured of a life everlasting. So as we come to this time, you have your cups with you, the body of Christ broken for you.
and the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. We come to this time of, of praying and sharing. So we have our opportunity to pray for one another and to share our love and lift the people up that need to have God's help and God's guidance, God's forgiveness, God's grace, and God's mercy for them. And I know this week we've had a lot of things going on, and we've had people that have uh, hurt themselves. Pastor Terry fell and, and hurt his shoulder again yesterday, uh, slipping on the ice, and Carla hurt her hip. And so hopefully she can get in to the doctor and get some relief today. And we have a loss that we are going to celebrate, a loss of life that we're going to celebrate today. And as Pastor Terry said, we've had quite a bit of loss here that we've dealt with in the last few weeks. And as believers, one of the nice things is we have that assurance that death is not final. And that we have that promise of eternal life through Christ. And see, that injury that we have is not final because God is the great physician. And when we come to him in prayer and petition for ourselves and for others, when we lift others up, it gives God the opportunity to work in and through us. As again, it's that ability and availability to help others in our community of believers and even those who are outside that community of believers. So we lift these prayers up, and, and we lift those up, those prayers that we have had submitted to us, both silently and aloud, and we lift them up into God's care today. Lord, we come before you right now, and we lift up these prayers that have been submitted to us, both silently and aloud. Lord, we lift up what is on our hearts, some of us come to you with heavy hearts today. Some of us come to you with hurting hearts today, and we lift them all up into your care and comfort. And we know that in and through you, Lord, anything is possible. That you are the great physician. That you will heal in your own way and in your own time. You will heal each and every one of these people. Heal their brokenness. Heal their physical bodies. Heal them spiritually, Lord, to bring them back home to you. So we claim all these things by prayer and petition in Jesus' name, and we claim them as a victory today. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us this opportunity to bring these prayers and these petitions to you. In your holy name we pray. I would invite you to uh, stay on our page after the feed or the live finishes this morning. Um, even though we won't be singing in person, we're going to put some videos up uh, so you can worship uh, and, and really see the theme of, the, of being available in that music. In fact, one of the songs is actually called Available, and it's by Elevation Worship, and it is a very powerful worship song that um, definitely wants you to enjoy today. Now, before I close this in a final prayer, I was drawn to Numbers chapter 6, back to the Old Testament. If we don't understand where we've been, we can't understand what the New Testament truly means. And so I invite you, as you're doing your studies, to please study the Old Testament. If you have questions about how to study, what to study, please reach out to Pastor Mark and myself. Because we want to guide you. That's that's. Being a pastor means being a shepherd. We want to shepherd you. We want to help you through your, with your walk. So this is what the Lord said to Moses. He said, to tell Aaron and his sons to bless the people of Israel with this special blessing. And I, when I hear or read that, I also hear 
the Lord saying, Pastor Mark, Pastor Terry, I need for you to bless the people, my children, with a special blessing. And here it is. It says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. Father, as we prepare to end this time together, we do ask for your protection. We do ask that you smile on us and that you are gracious to us and that you will show us your favor and give us your peace. But Father, we need to bring our faith into action too. This isn't a one-way relationship, Father, we, and we need to be reminded of that. Father, help us to come to you first. Help us to pray about the things that you would have us do. Help us to pray about do, what we need to do and what we need not to do and how we can be available to meet those divine appointments that you have set for us, Father. Father, as we prepare to end this time together, we just thank you for all the many blessings in, in our lives. You've given us uh, uh, this ministry. You are growing this ministry. You've You've now presented us with a, a new space that we can call our own. Let us go into that space. Let us, as the scriptures say, be fruitful and multiply. Because we want to serve. We want to love. We want people to know the hope that we have in you. Let us use our gifting. And let us be available to shine you to everyone out there. In Jesus' precious and holy name.